Who gave me the signal? Did he? Okay. Thank you, Zach. Uh, good morning. Welcome to our uh, service of worship uh, with the South Yarra congregation at Balaclava. Uh, as we continue to uh, hope to return to our building following the fire. Um, and welcome to those of you watching on the live stream. We're uh, affected by uh, this current wave of uh, the pandemic and other illnesses going around. Um, so uh, we're thankful to Zach and uh, Toby for making it possible to live stream again. I've um, got a couple of announcements. I, now, now that I can see Jack up the back, uh, I can uh, say there is a special congregational meeting after the service, which was announced last week. It's a, a brief one, just some uh, legalities to do with the National Redress Scheme and uh, getting ourselves set up in that structure. So that'll be a brief congregational meeting. Uh, notices um, regarding the Board of Management. Uh, these are all in the bulletin, but I want to draw your attention to them. Uh, there's a special board meeting tomorrow night at, uh, at the college in Box Hill. Uh, that's at seven o'clock. Uh, we also are having an election. We have elections every year for the Board of Management. Uh, there are six elected managers and three of them are up for, three of those positions are up for re-election each year. So any, if you have nominations for those positions, please uh, submit them to uh, Jack and Lowen as session clerk by next Sunday. And we note that uh, the three current serving board members, uh, Andrew Venning, Brad Georges and Matthias Poy are eligible to be renominated. Um, they feel you know, not a bad idea to ask them if they want to be. Uh, the Bible study is scheduled to meet on Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. at Beth and Demas House. This is in Windsor, and if you'd like to know the address for that, uh, please ask me. Um, also, uh, it's encouraging to hear regarding the Men of God Men's Conference, uh, which is next Saturday morning at the college. Uh, there are apparently a lot of men of God in the PCV because the word on the street is that there's uh, something like 100 people already registered. How about that? Um, and registration's close tomorrow night. So if you want to join uh, a laudable crowd, uh, please um, uh, get in touch with the college about that. We uh, thank Jared for stepping in to preach today, uh, as Ben Nelson can't be here. And uh, we thank him as he will now lead us in the worship of God. Thank you, Ben, and good morning, and welcome to our service this morning, and welcome to those who are participating as best they can at home. Um, I'm going to assume that you have been sick, you are sick, or you're just about to be sick. Um, whatever it is, it's going around. Uh, some people have COVID, and there's something else going around as well. Um, my family is in the something else category at the moment, um, but it's uh, you know, winter lurgy time, isn't it? Uh, we gather together to worship our God. Let me read to you from Psalm 146. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth. If you take your hymn books, we'll sing our first hymn, uh, based on the words of that psalm, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. It's hymn number 16, hymn number 16.
us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You commanded, you spoke, and all sprung into being. And all is according to your will, and everything in this world and round about us today falls out according to your will. We give praise and thanks to you, our God, that we are surrounded always by your loving, providential hands. We thank you that your affections are set upon your church. And we thank you that we feel your love around us at all times. Our Heavenly Father, particularly at this time when we might be feeling a little bit low, there are many who are sick, Uh, we give you thanks that you are still our great shepherd and our friend. We give you thanks that uh, Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. We thank you that he came to save his sheep, to call them, to bring them to salvation. We thank you that in the cause of bringing salvation to us, he was willing to lay down his life. Our great caring friend. We thank you for all that his death means and tells us. And we thank you that it is the great work of atonement that deals with our sins. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have sent your spirit into our hearts so that we know the voice of our shepherd and we follow after him. Lord God, keep us from looking elsewhere for that which we might think could save us, could help us in this world. We don't want to put our confidence in princes today, or in any false shepherd of the flock. The Heavenly Father, we thank you that you uh, work with us, you live within us by the Spirit, and you bring to us even humility and a contrite heart. Even though we don't always feel those things within us, Yet we know that you draw near to those who are humble and contrite in heart. And our Father, we come to you this morning because we want and we need your blessing. We want and we need to live in your presence. We want and we need to hear your word. We thank you for this opportunity that we have together with your people to sing your praise, to pray to you, to read your word together, to sit under the the preaching of the word. These are great blessings. We thank you for this slice of heaven, for for this real world that we have now in these few moments together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is a foretaste of all the good things that will be ours through all eternity. And we look forward to that day when we will meet around the throne when we will see your face and spend our lives only in praise and adoration in the brightness, in the light of our great triune God. And so lift us up in worship today. Help us to put aside all the things that would hold us back and keep us from truly being in your presence now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We will have our Bible readings now. The first comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and the second from John chapter 10.
you open with me now to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, the most familiar passages in the Bible. <clears throat> Verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaninglessness, meaninglessness, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever turning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear. It's fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, there is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Amen. Turning now to the New Testament of God's Word, to the Gospel according to John, chapter 10. Uh, this is on page 1075 of the Church Bibles. Uh, John 10, beginning at verse 1. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, this is Jesus talking, anyone who does not enter by the sheep pen, enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought, them all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand that he was telling them what he, what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason that my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Amen. Uh, we now come to uh, our uh, reading from the uh, 
sorry, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, this is in your bulletin, those of you who have a bulletin. Uh, and uh, it's question 26 today. So I'll read the question and um, if we can read the answer together. Question 26. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Answer. Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. There's a wonderful array of uh, scripture verses below, and I hope that you'll uh, read through them uh, at some point today, and and also this short commentary. Uh, You you might remember that um, uh, we're in a subsection of the Catechism, which is going through what it calls the offices that Christ executes as our Redeemer. So these are three distinct roles that he performs as as the Redeemer of his people. And uh, the the Bible lays this out essentially, but the Catechism summarises the Bible's teaching that uh, he's shown as a prophet, a priest and a king. And we come today to the third of those, uh, to, to Christ as, as the king. Uh, it, noticing this reminds us that J- Jesus redeems us into his kingdom. It's a kingdom of redemption. And this redemption means freedom from the power and the penalty of of sin. Freedom to live as we were created to live. So thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing again. The hymn is 64, Praise to the Holiest in the Height. 64.
the stewards will now wait upon you for your tithes and offerings if you choose to give in that way. Let us sing again. The hymn is 253. Blessed Jesus, at your word we have gathered now to hear you. Hymn 253. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, well, we come briefly to the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. Um, in many respects, it is a fairly dark book. And uh, might be suiting the season, the coldness and perhaps darkness of winter. Um, many people have struggled with Ecclesiastes over the years. Uh, although it would have to be said that as our society has become increasingly introspective and neurotic, I think Christians are finding more comfort um, in this particular book. It's actually a really important book. And it's very important because it is so honest. And it really does explain what it is we go through in this life. It really does explain what this world is like. So it describes life, warts and all, and heartaches and all, and existential angst and all. 
We're coming to the introduction to Ecclesiastes, so chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Even just this much is unrelentingly negative, and you might even think depressing. Uh, Make no mistake this morning, though, these opening verses are not only describing a person who is having an existential crisis, but it is saying that we ought to be having an existential crisis too. They're saying with all the authority of God's word, But there really is something wrong in the world. We need to think on that and we need to feel that. And Christians sometimes struggle to find meaning in this world. Well, this is saying that's okay, but more than that, it's necessary that we struggle to find meaning. This should actually be the continuing nature of our lives. Life is an existential crisis. Life, you can quote me on that, life is one long existential crisis. And so you saw the title of the sermon in the service sheet. um, How to have an existential crisis. How to have a life crisis. And you probably thought I was being a bit whimsical. I was trying to get the tone of the passage. This is the voice of this passage here. And in all seriousness, Christian, in some respects, with a few asterisks and a few terms and conditions, you really ought to be having an existential crisis. And I tremble to take this text up, really, because I can see how easy it would be to get the wrong end of the stick with this text. How easy it would be to misunderstand what it's saying. And then you would go home in a worse condition than what you came in. So can I ask you this morning if you would please give the utmost attention to this text. Don't just tune in and out. Uh, Give your utmost attention to this text and really search out what it's trying to say. Search out its intention, its meaning, and even see the nuance of it, because there's nuance there. If you miss the point, if you miss the point, this could really damage your health. But if you will tune in, there is great wisdom here for you in this world. Uh, There is Nothing else quite like this in scripture. Um, It is rough medicine. It is going to cut you up into little pieces, but then it will put you back together and it will bring you health and it will bring you healing and it will bring you help in this rather problematic world that we live in. So let's jump in. Um, Here is how to have an existential life crisis. So firstly we come, well, verse 1 introduces the author. There's a lot of debate about this. Who is the author? Uh, I'm going to go with it being Solomon here. This is King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon, uh, the richest and most powerful of Israel's kings from the ancient world. Uh, He calls himself the preacher or the teacher. Uh, He calls himself kawalet, if you've heard that term. That's the Hebrew word that's used here. Um, Whatever that means, it means he's a man with a message. He's a man with a message for the people of God. What's the message? Verse 2. He comes straight to it. He just comes right out and says it. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity, as the old translation put it. Emptiness, emptiness. Everything is empty, meaningless. It's all meaningless. It's all like a vapour. Life is just the wind. It's a pretty rough way of starting a book. We've been given no warning 
about this, have we? There's no early warning system. Nothing is signalling us as to what this means. There's no trigger warning here. (laughs) He just jumps straight in so abruptly. Emptiness, emptiness. Everything is empty. Stop and think on that. Why does he start like that? Why does he start like that? Now he's going to go on and explain what he means. He'll do that very quickly. He'll do that unrelentingly over many chapters, but he just jumps in with the conclusion. Why? Why does he do this? I think he's making a really powerful point in doing that. I think part of the point here is we just naturally get it. We don't need an explanation in one sense. We just naturally get this. We naturally feel this. We understand it. We don't need to be told. It's how we feel. We get the angst. We understand it instinctively, viscerally. Emptiness, emptiness. Everything is empty. I think in starting like that, I think he's validating something that we naturally feel. Scripture is saying, yeah, we get it. We know that you feel like that. And in many respects, you've got sound reasons for for thinking that. We viscerally, instinctively understand it, even if we can't quite fill it all out and explain it all. We get something there, don't we? I read in the paper yesterday, 40%. 40% of young adults in Australia indicate they have had a mental health problem recently. And that's up from 20% about 15 years ago. Apparently this this isn't just COVID either. This is an ABS survey that's been done. You've got to ask, well, what's going on there? 40% of young adults... Apart from the fact our society has failed them, of course. Apart from the fact that our increasing paganism just utterly fails our young people. What's going on there? I think when you get to a figure like 40%, you have to start saying this is the common experience of humankind. I mean, this is what everyone feels. I don't want to claim that I fully understand that data there, and I haven't really given it that much attention, but my guess is, What's going on there in part is that young people don't have the interpretive grid to understand what they're feeling. Uh, They feel bad and they say it's a mental health problem. They, They think some strange malady has befallen them. They get surprised when they feel bad. I think Ecclesiastes is saying, well, you've got every reason to feel bad. There's a lot to feel bad about. Of course you feel bad. Let's just say it up front. Things are bad. Meaningless, meaningless. Of course you could be sitting there this morning thinking, I don't know what he's talking about. I think life's pretty rosy. Uh, My life is like a hovercraft flying through on the clouds. Life is great. I don't know who those people are, but maybe there's someone like that. Ecclesiastes would also address you in those circumstances. I think it would be saying to you right from the get-go, your life is not meant to be a hovercraft sailing on the clouds. You've got to wake up today, wake up and smell the roses. That's an expression, isn't it? Wake up and see the reality. Life is bad. Life is bad in so many ways. Meaningless meaningless and your God doesn't want you to be ignorant of this real world even if ignorance is bliss God does not want you to be ignorant and he wants you to feel this now we need to make a clarification here I said there's some nuance here let's come to some nuance on this point of meaninglessness and please please listen up now (laughs) Uh, Please don't miss the terms and conditions apply part. Please don't miss the asterisk and the footnote. Ecclesiastes says, 
All is absolutely miserable in the world. Let's add some nuance to that. It does not, in fact, mean, it does not, in fact, mean that everything in the world is just as bad and horrible and terrible as it could, as it could be. It does not mean that. It does not mean that everything is pointless at all. I know it seems to say it, it doesn't quite mean that. What's going on here? This is hyperbole, isn't it? Now, can we introduce the notion of hyperbole this morning? Hyperbole, what's hyperbole? Fancy word for exaggeration. Hyperbole is when you exaggerate for dramatic effect or for a communicative or an educational effect. And scripture loves hyperbole. Scripture's always using hyperbole, which is a point of hyperbole to say it like that. Um, always using hyperbole. Jesus used hyperbole, didn't he? If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, he doesn't mean that literally. It's exaggeration, but you get the point. And here we have hyperbole. Is everything meaningless? No, it's not. And of course it's not. The book is going to go on and show you very meaningful things. It's going to show you where you can find real meaning, complete meaning, the most meaningful life you can have. It's going to relate all that to you. So it's hyperbole. Don't underplay what it's saying. Don't overplay what it's saying. So the point would be then, that you actually should be overwhelmed to some extent with this world and for particular reasons as well, which the text has not yet laid out. Be overwhelmed with this world to some extent within certain boundaries and for particular reasons, for justifiable reasons. You should feel something of what this verse is saying. But just hear the way the book expresses it, though. Don't qualify it too much. The author wants to make a point. Feel the point. Emptiness, emptiness, all is emptiness. Let the hyperbole do its work there and feel the intended force of these words. Ecclesiastes is really trying to turn the lights off here before it will switch them back on. So it deliberately uses hyperbole as it were to flick the, flick the lights off, to create a sense of darkness before it comes to the light. That means we come to point two this morning. Uh, point two, the lights are, are out here. Uh, we're in the dark. All is meaningless. Second strategy for having an existential crisis, verse three. Realise today that all your hopes will be dashed. All your hopes in this world will be dashed. Set your heart on many things in this world and realise you won't attain them. Spend your life trying to grasp that which is beyond you. Verse 3, what profit has a man from all his labour in which he toils under the sun. What are the longings of your heart today? What are your hopes and dreams? What do you focus on? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What keeps you going during the day? What are you aiming at with your life? What keeps you pressing on? Ecclesiastes is going to explore those ideas. It will explore your desires. It's not going to assess your desires as to whether they're right or wrong. It's not particularly concerned with that. That's one of the surprising features of Ecclesiastes. It's not going to take a moral approach to that issue. It's just going to ask you, do you actually ever get what you want? Do your dreams come true? Here in verse 3, here is one of the things we hope for. It speaks of work here, labour. We don't mind working, we don't mind labouring. That's all fine. But when we're working, when we're labouring, there's an expectation there, isn't there? There's a hope there, maybe even a dream there. What is it? We hope by our work that we should get some gain of some kind, some profit. 
That makes sense, doesn't it? We go to work, we expect to get paid. That's how things normally work here in Australia. It's not quite what Solomon is talking about, though. He's not asking you, what's your income here? He's asking, what do you really gain from your work? What are you really hoping for from your work? This isn't just a little question mark here. This is a huge question mark. What profit is there from all of your hard work in this world? And and you know what he means, don't you? The things we're really striving for in this life. It's always haunting us in our minds. What do we really gain by doing this? And so you get up in the morning and you go off to work and you come home and you go to bed so you can get up in the morning and do it all again. What do we really get? And so we get these ideas, oh, I need a sea change. Or I need a tree change. I need to do something to find meaning. Deep desire of the human heart for something not even sure we can necessarily work out what the something is, but we know we want it. What's the classic middle-aged man problem? Midlife crisis. Gets to middle age, career is established, he's got his money, realises what's the point, goes and buys the red sports car. I'm looking for something. Nothing wrong with red sports cars, by the way. If you have a red sports car, that's fine. Just don't think that's your real meaning. What's the gain? Solomon asks. Our next door neighbours just sold their home this week. Staggering sum of of money. I'm just flabbergasted. I mean, maybe it's normal to you, but to me, I'm just shocked. In the over a million dollars, it's just, I can't, can't fathom it. But look, they've worked hard for that. They've worked hard all their lives for that. And and now what are they going to do with their money? They're going to go around Australia. That's great. I'm I'm very happy for them that they can do that. That's wonderful. And then they'll come back and they'll settle into their new home, which will be a smaller home, of course, because they're retiring and their kids have grown up and so on and so forth. So a smaller home. And then what do they do with all that money? Well, they might take another holiday. Eventually they're going to have to use it to buy into a retirement home. There's a smaller place, you see. And then what's the next step? From there on, all that money to get your bed in the nursing home. And you see, you work hard with all that money as the world around you shrinks. Where is the meaning in that? Ecclesiastes isn't saying don't work hard. It's not saying it's always wrong to long for things. Some of the things we most deeply long for are good and right. Some of the things we long for are hardwired into us. Meaning that God made us to want those things. We have been made to want success, to want what Solomon calls profit. Here, God made us for it. You can't just say, stop feeling that way. Don't be what God made you to be. And yet Ecclesiastes still gives the answer back. You still don't get what you want. Even if your deepest desire is right and just, your hopes will still be dashed in this world. At least if they were bad desires, malevolent, selfish desires, we'd get it. We don't get what we deserve. Or what we want, we get what we deserve, rather. But when your desires are actually sound and your hopes are still dashed, that, that's the most difficult thing of all. And Ecclesiastes is saying, that's what life is like. That's what you have to face up to. And it's rough. It's really, really difficult. This crushing statement, what profit? What profit? You see just what a a massive bucket of ice water this is that Solomon's just thrown in us here. This is really hard. It is crushing. 
It's humiliating. It's very humbling. Very humbling. What's gone wrong with this world? That it's like this. Something must have gone seriously wrong with it. And Ecclesiastes is saying, face up to it today. Face up to it. And so we come to thirdly this morning. Third strategy for having an existential crisis of biblical proportions. Are you up for a third one? We press on. We come to thirdly, verses 4 to 11. We're still on in the introduction. An avalanche of stone cold reality. Raining down is here. The third strategy for an existential crisis is this. Why don't you take a look around the world? Look at the nature of this creation and see just how trapped you are, how trapped you are in an unchanging and uncaring world. See just how much you cannot change this world. See how little impact you have on this world. Verse 4, one generation passes away, another generation comes, the earth abides forever. Verse 5, the sun rises, the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. Verse 11, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by the things that are after it. Now, I'm not going to go into all that detail there, but it's an avalanche, isn't it? It's an avalanche of uselessness, of human uselessness. This world, this created order, it just rolls along without change, without development without improvement, and ultimately without you. You in this world. You in this world, no impact. No importance. You can't change this world, you can't fix this world, and it won't even remember you when you are gone. Now we like to think of ourselves as being somehow important at least, don't we? We have some importance. We have some influence in the world. We're we're powerful in some way. We'd like to think we make a difference in some way. It's partly a modern pretension that we're we're change makers. We always talk about change these days, don't we? They they teach the young kids in school, change the world. (laughs) And here we have this rich and powerful man What does he say to this idea of be change makers? He says, grow up. Grow up. You can't change the world. You're a a pipsqueak in this world. And that strikes us hard too, doesn't it? I didn't imagine I was going to rule the world in the sense of be some great dictator or something, but I thought I had some influence. I thought I had some impact. And you rightly think that you ought to. That's the thing here. You ought to have some impact. We have been made to have some impact in this world, haven't we? In fact, we have been made to rule this world, no less. We have been made to rule this world. God has made you to master this world and to have it in subjection. Right back there in Genesis 1 it says it. And somehow this world seems to master you. It keeps you in subjection. And one day this world will, how do we put it, will absorb you. Something's gone wrong, hasn't it? Ecclesiastes wants you to see it. You're trapped by this world. Something is seriously wrong. And that is as far as our text takes us this morning. That's the end of the introduction. Should we just stop this morning? Ecclesiastes is trying to flick the lights off and it's done a good job. It's not trying to make you bright and cheery. So let the abrasiveness of it 
Let the roughness of it wash over you again. It's what the author wants here. It's what your God wants through this text for you. I I don't want to flick the lights back on. The, The text is finished. I don't want to make this all brightness and joy straight away. I want the author to have his say in the way that he wants to have his say. But, but having said that, are you starting to twig as to what the book is really about? What is it thinking the problem is? It's already laid it out what the problem is, but why? Why is the world like this? Why are the lights being flicked off here? Why is this world so broken? If you can figure out why the world is like it is, then the lights will begin to come back on. What has gone wrong? And do notice Ecclesiastes doesn't want to leave you in the dark, by the way. If you kept on reading, it is going to flick the lights back on. It's not saying here, just be depressed. Just crawl in your little hidey hole. Just eat ice cream. It's not saying that. There's more to the book. I don't want to give the game away though. And yet I can't help it. So spoiler alert for the rest of the book. Spoiler alert. A big clue. What is so wrong with the world that we could say all the things we've just said in such a depressing way? Two words. What is wrong with the world? Genesis 3. Genesis 3, or another two words, the fall, or the thorns, and the thistles, or the returning to the ground. That's what Ecclesiastes is on about. I like to put it to my students at college. Ecclesiastes is Solomon writing his PhD. Someone gave him a topic to write on. The topic was trace the impact of the fall upon humankind. And he does that and he does it rigorously in every sentence, in every chapter. He shows us the impact of Genesis 3, the fall, when Adam and Eve took from that tree. And God cursed the world. And it's a real curse. And it impacts us in every way, in every avenue of our lives. It's funny because somehow we always forget it though, don't we? We always seem to forget Genesis 3. And we, we bustle on through our lives and we expect good things and happy things and good outcomes. And then we get all shocked when something goes wrong. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Solomon was writing Ecclesiastes for people who kept forgetting Genesis 3. He was writing to a culture that kept forgetting Genesis 3. In fact, Solomon is writing a book of wisdom here, isn't he? This is called wisdom literature. It's a style of writing. It's a genre of writing. You will find across the ancient Near East, not just in Israel, but across the ancient Near East, this this worldview, this way of looking at the world, this style of writing, the, the, the wisdom way of seeing things. And you can go and read that literature from the ancient Near East. Most of it's very optimistic. Most of it's positive. Most of it is optimistic pragmatism. Do good, good things will occur. Be good to the king, you'll get a promotion at the court. This kind of stuff. It's all optimistic. Solomon says, Genesis 3 though. Wait a minute. Your wisdom has not accounted for Genesis 3. Has the wisdom of the world today accounted for Genesis 3? Have you in your thinking accounted for Genesis 3? The fall, the fall. Don't ever forget Genesis 3. God cursed the world and that puts a roadblock in every avenue or a road bump every street you go down. Nothing is left untouched by the sweat of your brow until you die. You know that today, don't you? Genesis 3, everything in your life and anything could go wrong. You are exposed to all kinds of dangers. The elements are against you. You are exposed to public shame and ridicule. You're exposed to alienation. There is no disease that is off limits to you. Genesis 3, you see. Genesis 3. And it is so helpful to hear. 
As hard as it might be, it's helpful. It's so helpful because it explains how we're feeling and what we're seeing. It gives you the interpretive grid you need to understand what is going on. And if you can see the problem, you'll see the solution. If you can see the bushfire, you'll know where to run. And that's when the lights begin to flick back on, don't they? And Ecclesiastes will flick those lights back on even though there's still pain in this life and heartache and angst, there is still light. Ecclesiastes is going to go on to say, there's a pathway through it. He's not going to say, oh, we'll make your life perfect, a hovercraft sailing on the clouds, not in this world. It's going to say, amidst the storm, there is a path through, though. There is a way through. And what's the pathway today? Let us encourage ourselves with this. What's the pathway through today? But to take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, in repentance, to take hold of Jesus Christ, to take hold of our God, Jesus Christ, who lived for us in this world, who died for us in this world, but then he rose. And that's the beginning of the new creation. And we take hold of him because he can bring us through to that new world. He gives us himself in this world to help us through and then we enter into that new life in the new world. There's a pathway through. What did we sing in that second hymn this morning? Oh, loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame and when all was darkness and all was pointlessness, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. We have a second Adam. We have a second creation. And so we say it with angst this morning but with an inexpressible joy as well, meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless of this world, just this world, just this world under the sun. Because we fully know that we can make our way through this world and we can enter into the joy of the next life, of the risen life, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, help us to understand this passage aright and help it to do its work upon us. Lord God, help us to pay attention to it. This whole book And our God, we uh, give you thanks that uh, you again speak so openly to us in your word, so directly. Our God, we, we know we have our struggles in this world. We think that you are able to explain them to us. And we look around at all the philosophies and worldviews and religions and we see them struggling really to explain these things. We confess before you that we share in the sin that has brought all of these problems upon us. We sinned in Adam. We sin because of Adam. We choose ourselves to sin. And thus in Adam all die. And we acknowledge that you are right and just to bring that sentence of death upon us. But Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that from the outset, after that fall, you gave your gospel promise. And so we give you thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ again. We thank you that he is the new start, the new creation, the second Adam. We place all our trust in him. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would continue that work of recreation uh, in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, in our thinking, in our wills. Help us to take thought every captive. Uh, Take every thought captive. But also every emotion and anything within us that is not pleasing to you. And Lord, this gospel message is hard, we know, because it starts by talking about sin and fallenness. But Lord, help us to be evangelists of this very gospel, which looks to be so foolish to the world, so harsh, and then so ridiculous, because it speaks of a man from the dead. Lord, help us to convince people that this really is the only hope, the only way forward. We thank you for all those who are trying to spread your gospel around the world today. Uh, We thank you for our missionaries. We thank you for uh, the ministry of uh, organisations like MRF and so on. We thank you for those who take the gospel to the difficult places of the world, to Islamic countries. Heavenly Father, help none of us to grow afraid or fearful of how we might be received with this message. Our Lord, we also pray for all our sickies today, people who are struggling with COVID and other uh, issues. We commit them to you. Lord, we perhaps assume that they'll be well, but we shouldn't, and we commit them to you. And Lord, we ask you would raise Ben up in particular, Uh, because we want him to continue ministering to us, uh, because he has work on the weekend at the ministry conference, at at the uh, conference at PTC. And so restore him to health and to vigour and to joy as well. Uh, Lord God, we ask that you would protect us this week, uh, keep us from um, colds and flus and, and COVID, if that be your plan for us, but keep us spiritually Keep us in your love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.